Hello, I'm the Irish guy, and welcome back to the Prem Catch-Up, right? Take a look at every Premier League result from the weekend. But lads, first of all, I just want to say, okay? As of tomorrow, I'm chucking in the YouTube channel to become a librarian, where I get to spend every day chewing on every page of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Um... April Fool! Ah, I'm so desperately alone. Right, let's go. By the way, if you're new here, hit that subscribe button. It will numb the pain of what I'm going to have to do tomorrow. Just please hit that subscribe. I'm really not looking forward to the paint. Right, let's go. Man City nil, Arsenal nil. <laughs> oh dear, play the clip. Man City 5, Arsenal nil. I'm gonna say this. This is gonna be the worst night in Arsenal's recent history. It's gonna be cruel beyond belief. I'm gonna say it. Manchester City 5, Arsenal nil. Arsenal are flying high, but so? This is what Pep Guardiola does. Once Arsenal lose on Sunday, they're gonna massively wobble all the way until the finishing line. Yes. Oh dear, I am sorry. Okay, I said this would be 5-0, instead it was 0-0, so, um, I was half right. Right? Now, this is arguably one of the worst predictions I have ever made. I said the Gunners would travel to the Eddie Hat and concede 5. You didn't concede any. You left this fortress of a stadium with a clean sheet. Lads, I have seen Arsenal crumble here so many times. I have seen them concede 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 goals here. Allah, I mean, I just tried to look up the team sheet for that crazy 6-3 loss here in December 2013. And, um... Well, this is why you shouldn't let the cricket enthusiast work experience kid publish the team sheets at the BBC. Because apparently Vincent Company was left back. Martin D. Michaelis was on the right wing. With Theo Walcott playing CDM alongside Lauren Koscielny. With Per Murdersacker, the German Dan Burnt left back. Olivier Giroud as the playmaker, number 10. With Jack Wilshire leading the line as the centre forward. You know, the southern hobbit. Who probably still needs his moment to get him the Rice Krispies off the top shelf. Weirdly, Serge Gnabry actually played in this horrendous defensively bonkers match but not here this weekend this was brilliant okay terrible to watch but Arsenal they remind me of Chelsea under Mourinho back in 2013 you know when the Gunners were conceding six that they had no Chelsea didn't win the league that year but they were in a three-horse race alongside Liverpool and Man City yeah Chelsea beat both teams home and away. Arsenal have not done that, no. But they have drawn at both Anfield and the Eddie Had whilst beating their rivals at home. They've played the best team in the world twice in the Premier League and haven't conceded a goal. This, this is title worthy stuff. This was the Gunners' first clean sheet here in nine years. Both William Saliba and Gavin Magalis were absolutely magnificent. I can't praise this dogly defensive display enough. It was like watching a Mourinho team of old. Incredible. Oh, look, the fallout from this match and criticism of Man City is Stupid. Roy Keane is saying that because Erling Haaland miscontrolled the ball once, that his overall play and technique is that of a League 2 player, that he's just a goal scorer and nothing else. I love Roy Keane, but don't forget, this is a man who tried to cripple Erling's dad and then wrote about it in his book? Is he really being objective when he's trying to call this guy the Norwegian Gary Taylor Fletcher? Lads, do you really think that Pep Guardiola would obsessively pick a striker who didn't have more to his game than goals? Because he had one of those. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, an absolute goal machine who never got involved in build-up play, clearly a Barcelona board signing, because Pep bid him off after just one year. Haaland's overall game might not be as world-class as his finishing now, no, but to call him a League 2 player? Roy, stop being a brain-dead cookie monster. But Arsenal, I am so impressed with this defensive display. And to me, I actually said that you would lose 5-0. 5-0! I am so sorry! Sorry, that was nonsense. But a small consolation is that 100 million pound star Jack Grealish was embarrassed by Guardiola the full-time whistle, getting the full, full brown treatment on the pitch. Honestly, that guy, he needs that move back to Aston Villa and he needs it yesterday. Go to Emery because Guardiola has clearly run out of patience and decided that you've actually got the tactical knowledge of a burnt muffin. Brentford won Man United one. Pathetic. I'm sorry, Manchester United. I know they're not involved in the title race, so their hard performance won't get that noticed by the mainstream media, but come on. What on earth was that? I was confident this would be a team on a mission to wrestle back pride from this ground after being 4 0 down at half time in the last visit. I mean, play the clip. Brentford won Man United 3. This will be easy. Goals from Bruno Fernandes, Marcus Rashford, and Eliandro Garnacho. Lads, if Brentford win this match, then I will lick a cat. There are so many stray cats that need to breathe a sigh of relief because right now, I should be currently wiping my tongue on the curtain and frantically googling the symptoms of ringworm. By now, my tongue should look like a wrinkly black slug. I should be slurping nine glasses of water to try and rescue my tonsils from the bubonic plague because there is no way that Brentford should not have won this match. I mean, I'm sorry. Brentford, 
Free fall Brentford, who lost 14 of the previous 18 Premier League matches. They should have won this match 4-0 again. I mean, Lissandro Martinez probably has traumatic nightmares about his last visit to this ground, where Ivan Tony made him look like a hapless hobbit. Lads, I remember when Mikel Arteta watched Ben White getting dominated by his old Peterborough teammate, Tony, in a pretty miserable 2-0 loss here back in 2021. Yeah. He very quickly turned White into a right-back, and the Gunners have fixed up and since been able to beat Brentford at their ground. So Manchester United, they, they're still as hopeless as they were two years ago. They let Brentford, tiny little Brentford, have 31 shots. Am I reading this right? Brentford. Tony had a goal rolled out. I don't know how the Bees did not win this match. Then Mason Mount thumps in a 96 minute winner. And I already know there have been floods of angry, just bearing Brentford fans immediately getting off their seats and storming out through the exits. I mean, some fat Brentfordonians would have been in the car park and already tucking into a McFlurry when Simon Iyer was finding space in the box to snaffle home a 99th minute equalizer. There were so many horrible things from Manchester United on Saturday. But I actually think a 1 1 draw is worse than if they had managed to escape with a 0 0. Because how how many Manchester United teams of the past have failed to see out the win after scoring a 96th minute winner? I mean, would that have happened under Fergie? Imagine if when Michael Owen scores that 96th minute winner against Manchester City, if instead they immediately had let Craig Bellamy waddle back up the pitch and score his hat trick goal to make it 4 4. Oh. Do you know why that would not have happened? Because even though it's a real Ferdinand would have known that if it had, Sir Alex would have probably fed him his own dog for lunch. You would not be allowed to carelessly chuck away a 96th minute lead under Fergie and yet under Ten Hag. Are there any repercussions for failing to deal with Tony in the box just moments before the 100th minute? No. But honestly, this is so dreadful. Just a terrible performance. These are the displays which get a manager sacked. Chelsea 2, Burnley 2. Chelsea are... Awful. Play the clip. Chelsea won Burnley nil. Yeah, okay. If Chelsea don't win this match, then I will chuck a bucket of red paint over my head. But still, it'll be close, okay? 1-0, cold timer penalty. And even then, the Chelsea players will still be booed off the pitch. <sighs> yeah, because it's Easter Monday and I'm pretty sure the shops are closed, tune in tomorrow. I promise you, tomorrow is paint day. It's going to be horrible. I'm actually going to have to dunk a bucket of paint over my head. Come back tomorrow and you will see. I'm angry. I have held my tongue about Mauricio Pochettino all season long because I do rate him as a coach. And Todd Bowley has assembled the most overpaid, ludicrously top-heavy cartoonish squad I have ever seen. And I have seen some positive signs from Pochettino, like reaching a League Cup final, taking points of Liverpool, Arsenal and Man City. But this is truly pathetic. Letting Burnley rock up a Stamford Bridge and play over an hour with 10 men after Lawrence Asignon was sent off before half time. And you still fail to win? I said this would be 1-0 cold Palmer penalty. And... That's exactly what it was at halftime. But no, Burnley choose to score twice. And you know what's incredibly annoying? The two Burnley goal scorers. The reason that tomorrow I'm going to be drenched in paint. They are... They're both Ireland internationals. Josh Cullen and Dara O'Shea. I mean, come on! Burnley are one of the worst public teams of all time. Hammer had broken them down with what should have been a 78th minute winner after a wonderful Cullen volley. But to then that O'Shea scored equaliser from a corner. That's bad enough. But then, Jay Rodriguez slaps the crossbar with a header. He could have won this match. That would have been Burnley's second 3-2 in a Stamford Bridge since Conte was in charge. They had 10 men on the pitch. A manager banished to the stands. And yes, for over an hour, this was a Champions League finalist manager versus Craig Bellamy. Someone sacked the Cardiff City for apparently bullying kids. This was him grinding out a point at a club who were still champions of Europe less than two years ago. It's just absolutely mental. And I'm sorry, Chelsea, but forcing me to stick a paint for the next month. I'm not going to sleep tonight because of that. I'm so terrified about tomorrow. You failing to beat the Clarets. It's ruined my way. It's going to ruin my month. Tomorrow is going to be absolutely brutal. Newcastle 4, West Ham 3. Well, that was crazy. That was laughably insane. <laughs> Lads, for most of this game, this story was about Newcastle's crippling injury list and the fact that Eddie Howe was getting closer to losing his job. After 75 minutes, this was a 3-1 West Ham win after goals for Michael Antonio, Mohamed Kudus and Jared Bowen. Newcastle's injuries were piling up. I mean, remember what I said about the BBC Sport page getting it wrong? They got it wrong again because... It was the number six position that was cursed. It was Lascelles being substituted for Kraft, who was substituted for Almiron, who was substituted for Barnes. I mean, lads, last week, Sven Bott was ruled out for nine months with an ACL. The perfect chance for club captain Jamal Lascelles to retain his place. Guess what? 
He's also out for nine months with an ACL. So he can't even engineer a summer transfer away. I mean, the fellow is getting linked with Besiktas and Leon in January. Lads, Newcastle are getting closer and closer to having adult cheerleader Paul Dummett. Someone who's only played four Premier League minutes this season and zero last season. He is soon going to be given his first league start in over two years. Yikes. So the injuries are crazy. But wow, if I am Calvin Phillips, I am just wanting to crawl into a cave and smash out every tooth with a rock. Anything to distract from the torture he must be going through. He is... A West Ham flop. It's official. This is a disaster spell. The opposite of that Jay Ling's loan. Because he enters the fray on 69 minutes. Probably embarrassed not to even be making the starting 11 for West Ham. And then he gives away a penalty after kicking Anthony Gordon's leg in the box. Isaac rolls in the penalty. And then Harvey Barnes scores twice. Including a sensational last minute winner from the edge of the box. Again, like Gordon was a year ago. Barnes has been written off as a flop. No, this guy is all about goals. And that winning strike, that was Messi-esque levels of accuracy. Fabianski did not want to have to deal with that. Just three weeks before his 39th birthday. But Phillips, that was the second penalty he's given away in a West Ham shirt. And um, he was giving the middle finger to angry West Ham fans who called him useless outside the ground after the game. It is over for him. You cannot do that. Phillips, you were the one who gave away the pen. You were the one who's been performing like a bloated... Pumpkin for months. Lads, I said moving to Manchester City would ruin his career. And it has. He's now just a fat Jack Rodwell. As we speak, I just know that he's probably comfort eating by gorging on 14 Easter bunnies. This is someone whose head is gone. He's probably just drinking Pepsi and eating popcorn on the loo. It is sad. I would go as far to say that KP's permanent career is over. Honestly, give it another 18 months and I reckon this guy is MLS material playing for LA Galaxy. Just that? Sheffield United 3, Fulham 3. Play the clip! Sheffield United nil, Fulham nil. Sheffield United versus Fulham. Oh, yuck. I already know this game is going to be absolutely terrible. So hideously low on quality. Ozzy, if this game is in the top three matches shown a match of the day, then I will pour a bucket of melted ice cream over my eyes. Just a horrible nil nil. Next, I mean, for every goal scored in this game, I will smear a banana into my nose. Sound like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> That's another one. Here comes another banana. Ah, ah. <laughs> another one. Because there are six goals in the game, so that means another banana. <laughs> I tip this to be a nothing, nil, nil match. And instead, it just has to be a 3-3 three, three thriller. It sounds like I'm clearly about as clever as a pregnant pumpkin. But to be fair, it was nil, nil after nearly an hour of the match. Yes, when Ben Berta Diaz pounced open the scoring after 58 minutes, that did open the floodgates. But I was right for almost an hour. But you know what? I should be relieved. Because this game was not actually even in the top three games of match of the day. Instead, it was what? Fifth in the running order? I was very confused. Well, I was watching Match of the Day, and it still didn't come on in the first 45 minutes. I assume that it must have blacked out on the couch? I'm sorry, who compiled that running order? Was it the same kid who thought Walcott was a CDM? Well, lads, I have massive sympathy for Sheffield United. How did they not win this match? Because Oli McBurney was taking the 4-1 up after 82 minutes. Party central mode? This should have been a rock star afternoon for the Blades. But now, VAR stupidly ruled it out because apparently Vinicius Souza was interfering with the goalie's eyesight in an offside position. I'm going to say this. I have always hated that rule. Ever since the late, great Czech Teote had an absolute wonder strike ruled out against Man City because Johan Gruffin was standing near Joe Hart. Yeah, Teote spent seven years at Newcastle and only got on the score sheet once, bless his heart. This is someone who throughout his entire career only ever had four goals to his name. So for that heartless ref of a zombie to deprive him of that moment, of that glorious goal, it did make me feel like ripping off the ref's ears and feeding them to a pig. Jeffrey United should have won this game, but... Forget about Chris Wilder. Nobody would have been sicker than Amanda Broya. Watching Ortega Muniz morph into Cristiano Ronaldo to acrobatically fire in a last minute volley for Fulham. And where has this guy come from? Before this club signed Broya on loan from Chelsea in January, Muniz was an absolute wet cottage pie in a Fulham kit. Don't forget, he was at Middlesbrough on loan last season and absolutely stunk up the place, scoring nearly 30 goals less than his strike partner Chuba Akpom, who right now is just a melted lollipop at Ajax. But ever since the Albanian rocked up at Craven Cottage to get some game time, Muniz has decided to be unplayable. Eight goals in his last eight games. But relax. I just know he's soon going to be given a shock P 
paper rumor linked to Real Madrid. But no, I can see through the purple patch. This is not the next Adriano, no chance. This is just another Amir Zaki. Forget about Mo Salah. Zaki was supposed to be the Egyptian king. He rocked up a Wigan Athletic in 2008, right? Yeah, he was scoring eight goals in his first 11 Premier League appearances, including a scorching bicycle kick at Anfield. Almost identical to Muniz's one this weekend. He was unironically being linked with the move to the Bernabeu. He was supposed to be an absolute megastar. Yeah, then the goals quickly dried up. Steve Bruce called him the most unprofessional footballer he's ever worked with. I mean, I'm not sure what Zaki did to annoy him. Probably just cut in front of him in the queue for the ice cream. Or maybe pinched the last cookie at Brucey's plate. Either way, after a world-class Last autumn of 2008. We never ever heard about him doing anything in the sport again. He only ever scored three more goals after that. No, not, not for Wigan, but in his entire career. I'm not sure what happened. It's almost like his talent was space jammed out of him and shoved into a teenage Sala. So sorry guys, don't get excited about Muniz. It's just a freakish purple patch. Just another Zaki. Liverpool 2, Brighton 1. This was a monster Liverpool win. Lads, when Danny Welbeck rattled in a brilliant volley after just 87 seconds. You know, a former Manchester United enemy sent to ruin your day. Someone who's probably still cheering on Arsenal to win the league. Oh, it probably caused the Liverpool fans to panic. But the control, the patience, hit back through Luis Diaz. And then eventually win it through a Sava strike. Ozzy. This was a brilliant Reds win. Former 2, Everton 1. Look, Everton are pretty much safe from the relegation zone right now, right? So I no longer need to wince when they lose. But still, even I felt how horrible this defeat must have felt. Lads, I like Bournemouth. And I am determined to be proven right in my fanfare for Andoni Iriola. And with every Cherries win, as they sweep closer and closer to Gary O'Neill in the table. Oh, I can almost cough the excitement out of my nose. Bournemouth are like the anti-Red Riding Hood. Because they are actually held bent on catching Wolves. But look, this was a brilliant Cherries win. And here is Dominic Solanke scoring his 18th goal of the season. Yes, 18. And yet Gareth Southgate fancies him about as much as I like eating chicken nuggets out of my grandma's arm piss. Well, as the Toffees equalized after Beto bullied Neto in the final five minutes. But in injury time, a cross is overhit into Jordan Pickford's box. He decides not to come and catch it, leaving a bewildered Seamus Coleman to, um, unopposedly chest the ball into his own net for one of the most painful own goals I've ever seen for the massively experienced club captain, who has battled his way back from a horror injury twice to score such a horrible own goal in the final minutes. No, shaming, no! Imagine how dreadful he will have felt on that coach ride back to Liverpool. He'll probably feel like he's just been forced to lick Sean Dutch's toothbrush. Tottenham 2, Luton 1. Poor old Luton Town. How devastating must this have been? Lads, I said that Luton beat Tottenham for the first time since 1987. Then I would run through a field dressed in nothing but a towel. Yeah. Then Tate Chong sticks them one love after three minutes. And I'll tell you, I feel like a family of spiders has just crawled up my nose. But no, Tottenham wind up winning 2-1 after Luton could not deal with the absolute pace of Brennan Johnson on the right wing. Honestly, that man, he's like the Welsh reincarnation of Aaron Lennon. Aston Villa 2 Wolves nil. Gary O'Neill is the most overrated coach in the league. Unai Emery just made him look every inch a bug-eyed rubber duck. 2-0. Easy. Easy win. Nottingham Forest 1, Chris Ballas 1. <sighs> Lads. I said that if I didn't get a perfect prediction this weekend, then I would eat 14 bowls of Cocoa Pops. So please, let's see, what did I say for Nottingham Forest versus Crystal Palace? Nottingham Forest 1, Crystal Palace 2. Ah! Palace will take the lead through a John Philippe McTella penalty. Nicholas Dominguez will snaffle in a second half equalizer for Forest before an absolutely sizzling wonder goal from Mateus Franca to win it. <sighs> I even said that John Philippe Matella would open the scoring. All I wanted was for Mateus Franca to score a wonder goal and I would have been proven right. But he wasn't even in the squad. So, oh, here come the Cocoa Pops. No milk, I'm eating this dry. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> the box is empty. I never want to see another Coca Pop again. 